Hello and welcome to the Rough Take. We're coming to you live from Southtown 101, deep in the heart of San Antonio, or downtown San Antonio, Texas. How we doing out there today? Uh, let's go ahead and pay some bills right quick. We're coming to you live on Pub Culture Radio. Want to go ahead and put out that we do have a promo code of Pub Sports at Manscaped.com. All you guys, you need to get yourself cleaned up, get, especially your man parts. Check out Manscaped.com. And you get $24 off an all-in-one package. Use Pub Sports. The promo code is Pub Sports. Make sure you use Pub Sports and you'll get $24 off an all-in-one package. So check that out at manscaped.com. All right, let's get it on. So first things first, the hot take today is going to be regarding the San Antonio Spurs, our San Antonio hometown San Antonio Spurs and a couple of trades that they've made, which you normally don't hear of the Spurs being involved in uh, in trade talks. Uh, they, they, they keep it low-key. They really don't do major roster moves um, as far as trading goes, right? You know, so, but they made two of them going into the trading deadline today. Hey, Vic, I get some, I, I'm getting some sound in my headset. I'm not sure what it is, but um, sounds like a like a stream. But uh so yeah. So our Spurs had two trades uh that they did. Uh the first one was the, I'm going to start with the most recent one then I'm going to go from there cuz there was two trades they did. So the first one uh just happened a little bit earlier today uh was they did a, they made a trade with the Celtics. Thanks Vic, we're good. Um and so the trade goes down the trade breakdown is the Spurs get Josh Richardson, a spare part named Romeo Langford, and a top four protected pick, 2022 first rounder, from the Celtics. In turn, the Celtics get Derek White. I really like Derek White. I'm surprised that they actually went ahead and pulled the trigger and let him go. I think this was more of the Celtics wanting to improve their roster uh, so they got a bit younger, and and I'll now say to a certain extent better by taking Derek White off the Spurs' hands. Um, I can't tell you, I, I can't, it, it boggles my mind what the Spurs were looking at there. Um, I really like Derek White as a player. I really like what he was bringing, what he brought to the team, uh, especially from a leadership perspective. Uh, but I think more than anything else, this was the Celtics really pushing the issue to get this trade to go through because they were trying to improve their roster, and they definitely have improved it by uh, picking up Derek White. Now, the draft pick, it's a top four protected for 2022. What that basically means is as long as that pick isn't in the top four for the Celtics, the Spurs will get that pick. So more than likely, uh, odds are that the Celtics is not going to end up with a top four pick there. So for the most part, you can lock that in for the Spurs getting an extra draft pick this in this year's draft. Uh, so uh, Derek White goes to the Celtics. The Spurs get a draft pick, Josh Richardson and Romeo Langford. Uh, and another trade that happened prior to this one, uh, the Spurs picked up Goran Dragic and a protected first-round pick. I'll give you the breakdown on that in a sec. And they traded with Toronto, and Toronto picks up Tadeus Young, Drew Eubanks, and a 2022 Detroit Pistons second-round pick that the Spurs had. So here's the thing. Um, the, the Raptors are basically blowing it up again, right? And so... By picking up the Dayas Young, he's got an expiring contract. So they're just going to let him play the year out, uh, finish out the year, and then they'll go ahead and uh, probably end up – they won't re-sign him. So he'll end up somewhere else eventually. Um, and then they got Drew Eubanks, who actually um, is going to be waived. So it's been put out there that they're waiving him. So he's not – he's probably not even going to make the trip to Toronto at all. And then, of course, they're also getting that second round pick, which the Spurs are probably okay giving that up since they're picking up that first rounder from 
or they got the first rounder from the Celtics. So all in all, I think the Spurs, the, here's what I'm picking up from the Spurs as far as these trades go. Okay. I think what they're doing here is they have a pretty good idea of what they want to do. Uh, draft wise and player wise free agency. So it looks to me like they have a pretty good idea of who they're locking in as far as the draft goes. So they're making these moves, picking up picks to set themselves up to pick up the players that they're looking to pick up based on where they think they're going to end up landing. So they're making moves. Now here's the thing about the Spurs and, and what I like is that they have a lot of credibility with me when it comes to draft the draft. The Spurs have histor historically done very, very well with the draft. Uh, historically, they have they tend to find and pick up players that not only fit the, the Spurs mode of the players that they like to sign and pick up and have, but they have also managed to pick up players that end up producing and, and actually end up doing some things in the league. So... They have a lot of they, they, they have a lot of, of credibility with me when it comes to that. So I'm not necessarily looking down on these moves. I would have liked to have kept Derek White. It would have been very, very difficult for me to part with him. I like what he was bringing to the team. I like what he what, what he brought to the team, especially leadership wise. But nonetheless, I think they're looking at it from more of a draft pick perspective than anything else. The Toronto trade was just a matter of getting rid of players that they're not looking to continue on with in the future. So I'm expecting that Deus Young to become a free agent. And then Drew, Drew Banks already has been waived. So I doubt that either one of them are going to end up back on the Spurs. So uh, I'm really going to be paying attention to the draft to, end, to, to, to see who they end up going after and who they end up picking up. I think they do have a plan. I think they know where they're going with it. And at this point, it's just a matter of them executing the picks, picking up the players that they're actually looking for, and then hopefully that these players will end up producing and end up being about something. So I, I like it overall. Uh, my only knock was, you know, getting rid of Derek White, but, you know, you're, you're picking up an extra first-round pick this year. So that pick specifically tells me they they got their eyes on somebody and they needed to this pick to make sure that they had the leverage they need to be able to get to this guy and then there may be another trade in the draft you know they may have somebody pick up this guy for them and then they'll trade for him using this pick okay so that's a possibility as well so they may be picking up this pick just to have it in their back pocket in case they need to throw it at somebody in case they end up drafting somebody that they're looking at. So th that may be in play as well. Uh, so it, it they're, they're retooling and they're, they're definitely going to stay end up staying young for the most part, which is good. Uh, and, you know, I really, really like what they got going with the Dante Murray. And so I think he needs to be part of the nucleus, part of the core that we're going to have going forward. I think he's going to get better. Uh, he still has a, a ceiling to reach, a ceiling to hit, to hit to, which is good because that tells you that he's still going to get better. So the more he learns the game, the better he's going to be. So I really, really overall, I like it. Uh, and 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 uh, we just need to sit back and take a look and see what they end up doing with these extra picks that they end up having now. So they're going, they're going deep on this draft. They're going hard on this draft. So it's it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun to see, especially this draft, uh, to see what the Spurs, uh, our hometown San Antonio Spurs, end up doing with these picks. All right. So now on to the rest of the trades that happened. Uh, the blockbuster trade of the of of this this trading session just happened a bit ago, and it is a uh, James Harden being dealt. For uh, Ben Simmons. So the Sixers and the 
uh, Nets have basically decided to quit or trade for two quitters. Uh, Harden has given up on the Nets. And as we know, Ben Simmons don't gave up on the Nets last uh, on the Sixers as of last year. And he hasn't played all year long. So they basically have swapped quitters. And look, I, I'm going to give you the breakdown on the deal. And I think the Nets got over on them. I got over on the Sixers big time. Uh, I, I'm going to go with the three Stooges and they poked them in the eyes with this trade. I don't understand what the Sixers were doing, giving up this much. But the breakdown is Ben Simmons, Seth Curry, and Andre Drummond go to the Nets in addition to a 2022 first-round pick and a 2027 first-round pick for James Harden and Paul Millsap. Now, I think they could have done player for player there. I don't understand the need to throw in a first-round draft pick. Uh, James Harden definitely isn't worth that when you're giving up Ben Simmons. Uh, a younger, I'm not going to say a better player, but he's a younger player. And as long as he's able to come back and play right off the bat, hopefully he stayed in shape in this time that he's been off, then they're they're getting a legitimate player and, and a legitimately younger player at that. So I, I, it's a head scratcher for me on the Philly angle to see why they gave up so much. Uh, I guess if I got to give him a grade, I'm going to give him a D. Hopefully James Harden comes in motivated now that he's getting out of that. I'm going to say dumpster fire for lack of a better word, because you still got the situation with, with, with Irving and not getting vaccinated and only being able to play at home. So when they go on the road, there's no Kyrie Irving. So, um, I I I I think that the Sixers made a mistake giving up so much. As, uh, as far as the draft picks go, I don't think you needed to include draft picks, but okay, it, you know that that's the trade they went ahead and made. And so now we got to sit back and see what ends up happening. Um, on ESPN, they're getting a grade of C minus. I'm going to go as far as giving them a D, the Sixers, uh, for this trade. It, it it's it. Uh, it it, it, I just think they pay too much. Um, and Daryl Morey is familiar with James Harden uh, when you go back to their days in Houston together. So uh, he is definitely familiar with with, uh, with James Harden. And so I guess he's he'll, 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 he's justifying this trade just from that perspective. But the uh, Portland Trailblazers are officially in rebuild, in, uh, rebuild mode. They put an end to the Damian Lillard, CJ McCollum era, whatever that means. Um, you know, I get Damian Lillard's a good player, but CJ McCollum, I think he's more of a role player than anything else. Uh, they ended up trading CJ McCollum to the Pelicans. They're going to put him together with Brandon Ingram and Zion Williamson to see if they can get something going there with that duo. Um, and then, uh, excuse me, with Brandon Ingram, I should say, and Zion Williams. And then, the, uh, on Tuesday, the Kings, Sacramento Kings, traded for DeMontis Sabonis, Jeremy Lamb, and Justin Holiday from the Pacers. And they end up sending Tyrese Halliburton, Buddy Heald, and Tristan Thompson to the Pacers. So, that I, I mean, I, it's hard to say who got the better of the deal there. Buddy Heald is a pretty good player. Uh, and I think Halliburton is the same. As, I look at him in the same regard. Uh, the Montes a bonus, you know, perennial all star, you could say. Um, and then Justin Holiday has been hooping lately, so for now, I'm going to give Sacramento the better of the deal there. I'm guessing they're going to try to build around them, they're going to try to get something going with those three players. Um, those aren't some bad cornerstones at all to try to build around, so that's what I'm thinking. They're looking for an they're rebuilding, but they're looking for an immediate improvement on the same time that they're trying to rebuild. So, um, you know, th there's some pretty good players being exchanged between those two teams. So it may that trade may actually work out for both teams at the end of the day. Um, on paper, it looks like both teams actually did improve. Uh, for now, I'm going to give the Sacramento Kings the edge. I think they got overall better players. They may not be my much, 
but I think they got over overall better players there. Um, then you also had uh, the Nets waving DeAndre uh, Bembry to make room for Ben Simmons. Uh, you also had uh, Dorian Finney-Smith uh, uh, getting a new deal for your contract in the $55 million range from the Mavericks. Now, the Mavericks uh, actually was interesting because they ended up trading. Uh, this is the other big trade that went down. Dallas traded Christophe Porzingis to the Wizards for Spencer Dinwiddie and Davis Davis Bertans. Um, uh, salary, I guess. I'm, I'm guessing there. I, I really thought. I mean, they've given up on Porzingis, Porzingis obviously, because they traded him. Um, but the Wizards are making several moves. You're on top of that. Uh, they're also sending Montezel Harrell to the Hornets for Vernon Carey Jr. and Ish Smith. And then they also traded Aaron Holiday to the Suns. So uh, by trading Porzingis, it's a huge move for the Mavericks. They're completely uh, shifting where they're going in the direction that they're going. Because um, they did pick up, you recall, they picked up Porzingis from the Knicks. And, uh, um, and then so he would... I'm, I'm guessing he and he and Luka Doncic didn't uh, develop the chemistry or didn't develop the the you know whatever it is you want to call it together to convince them to go ahead and keep going with that. So they've gone ahead and traded for Zingas. Um, it's is as far as the Wizards, you know, they're just trying to you know get a shot in the arm there, um, and they're hoping for Zingas brings them a boost, brings them a kick, that kick that they're looking for. Uh, so Porzingis, uh, he's had a couple of uh, injuries, uh, surgeries to both knees. He's averaging, he's averaged 20 points, eight rebounds, and a block um, in his time with the Mavericks over three seasons. So he brings something to the table. The question is going to be how much. Um, and so, of course, they're building around Dorian Finney-Smith by getting him, giving him a four-year, $55 million extension uh, that tells you that they're going to build around him. So these pieces that they're bringing in, their focus is going to be Dorian Finney-Smith um, as far as the direction that the Mavericks are going. And then Widow, well, he brings them a scoring and playmaking boost there to that squad. So, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're basically doing a shift there. And uh, he had recently signed a three-year deal with the Wizards. So he's he's locked in, you know, for the immediate future. With the Mavericks, so um, and then they're probably going to try to bring in some more pieces through the draft. So those are the biggest deals that uh, that ended up happening. Uh, you know, coming into what was today the dread. I think the dread deadline was today at noon here locally. Um, another trade that did happen earlier today, prior to the deadline expiring, was the Bucks trying to shore up their squad for the playoff run. They picked up Serge Ibaka from the Clippers in a fourteen trade, in a fourteen trade, excuse me, along with the Kings and the Detroit Pistons. So, uh, the Bucks got Serge Ibaka, and the Clippers are sending uh, the the uh, the number uh, number two, a former number two pick, uh, Marvin Bagley, goes to the Sacramento Kings to the Detroit Pistons, and then Dante. Di Vincenzo goes from the Bucks to the Kings, and then Josh Jackson and Trey Lyles, who was with the Spurs at one point, one point, if you recall, are going to the Kings, and then the Pistons are sending two future second round picks to the Bucks. So there's quite a few pieces there, and also I'm forgetting the Bucks are also sending Semi Ojeleye. And Rodney Hood to the Clippers as part of that deal. So there's quite a, there's a quite a few pieces moving there. The biggest one being Ibaka to the 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 uh, Milwaukee Bucks to show up the the back court. I mean the front court. Excuse me. So Serge Ibaka is going to bring them some uh, some uh, a bigger body that they can put, put down low uh, to give them some more rebound, probably to take some of the load off of uh, of Giannis. And uh, so. That, that's what that looks like there. 
Um, so they're 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 trying to shore up their their squad for the playoff run that's coming up here. And and so that was another trade that went down. Um, I like that trade for the Bucks. I like them picking up a Baca, a veteran, bigger, you know, a big a, a big body that comes in, and will give them uh, definitely a more rebounding, a more of a defensive edge, and some more rebounding there. So not a bad pickup at all. Um, they lose some depth on the bench with DiVincenzo. Um, he's uh, young, but the biggest thing is he's coming off an ankle surgery, so he's only played 17 games this season. Um, yeah, he was he was uh, produced a lot more last year. But I think they're basically cutting their losses with him when it comes to the injury factor uh, with them trading him. Um, he was a starter last year, but of course he's been affected by the surgery, the uh, the ankle surgery that he had. And so he's only played in 17 games this past season. Um, and so they're, they're basically trying to shore up and make some moves here. And, and so it, it, some pretty big deals, pretty, pretty big deals. Uh, that went down, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. I'm really going to be keeping my eye out on the uh, Simmons and, and Harden trade. It's going to be really, really fun and interesting to see exactly uh, what ends up happening there. Um, and another trade that also went down um, that I forgot about for the Spurs, for our Spurs. Uh, okay, I got some comments in here. Let me hit. Let me hit those up right quick. Uh, Joseph Gomez says, uh, see what happens when you complain and went, want to be a superstar, but you don't play like a superstar. Um, I'm guessing he's referring to Harden. Uh, Danny Baca is old. Not sure what he's got left, but he can bang around Joel and B. That's, I think that's what they're looking at. Uh, as I mentioned, Joseph, they're, uh, they're looking, I think they're looking for him to bring in some defensive edge, another body, like you said, that can bang around. With Embiid, because uh, you're pretty much looking at a uh, more than likely will be, will be a Sixers and Milwaukee Bucks Eastern Conference final there. So I think they're really trying to shore up the squad and make preparations for that. Um, and uh, so what was that first comment? This is an example. The very first one. The What is that? Stream yard. Uh, oh, OK, OK. Um, so. So, yeah, Joseph, I think that's really what it is. I think you need the nail on the head, and I agree with you there. Um, it's just another big body that they can throw at Embiid, and um, I'm expecting him, you know, to bring him some rebounding, a little bit of rebounding edge there. Um, so it's more of a finals move. Um, but let me get back to the last trade that I had forgot about that the Spurs made, another trade that they made yesterday um, on the ninth. It was a three-team deal uh, where the Utah Jazz got, uh, Nikhil Alexander Walker and Juancho Hernan Gomez, who I believe the Spurs had just gotten earlier this season, and uh, they the um, and the Trailblazers end up picking up Joe Ingles, Elijah Hughes from the Jazz, and a 27, 2027 second round pick, and the Spurs ended up getting Thomas Santoransky and a 20 sec, 2022 second-round pick from the Jazz via Memphis. So uh, so the Blazers picked up Angles and Hughes from the Jazz. The Spurs sent Wancho to the Jazz, and the Blazers sent Nikhil Alexander to the Jazz. And we get Santo, uh, Satoransky from the Blazers. And I believe that pick comes from the Jazz. So... Uh, Santoransky, uh, we're looking at there. So it's, it's one of those, it's a salary cap deal for this. That deal for the Spurs came down to salary cap. Um, it's being terms as tax purposes. Hernan Gomez is going to make 3 million less than Santo, uh, Santoransky. So he saves Utah a lot of money. Um, and it doesn't matter to us because we're going to get a second round pick. Which again, this is what I'm saying. They're they're stocking up on picks. The Spurs are, so there's a plan through the draft, as far as I can tell. And so, expect Satoransky to get waived, so that we can use that spot to make another trade, which they did. That was the one earlier today. Um, and then it's going to give us some tax relief there, right? So, so that trade that was done back on the ninth was was. 
in lieu of the last trade that we just made. So there's there's several pieces and, and, and picks that are being moved for one to salary cap wise as far as saving us luxury tax money. And then of course bringing up roster spots so we can bring in more than likely a cheaper player. So we're just going to play out the season and then make the moves that we need to make with the draft picks and maybe some free agent signing. So there's definitely a plan for the Spurs. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt based on their history when it comes to being able to draft uh, good, competent players that end up contributing to the team and contributing in the league. So um, I like the trades overall. I like the moves. Now it's just a matter of sitting back and seeing what they do first and foremost in the draft, and then, of course, the free agency after that. So, a lot of wheeling and dealing, shaking and baking in the NBA today, of course, with the tread dine, tread deadline uh, that came and went today, expired today at noon, and so it was it was to be expected. So, there's several moves there uh, that we're going to keep our eye on, especially the um, Harden and Ben Simmons. I really, really want to see how Brett, what Ben Simmons looks like. Obviously, he's probably going to end up suiting up right away now that he's out of Philly. For all intents and purposes, he, he quit on them and just wanted out of there. So um, I'm going to be definitely be checking out these, uh, these next games for the Nets to see exactly what we're looking at as far as the, these trades they made. So now, Earlier this week, I'm going to go ahead and get into something that came across earlier this week uh, regarding uh, Jimmy Johnson. So uh, this is regarding the Spurs, I mean, the Dallas Cowboys and Jimmy Johnson. So, um, and this is kind of like uh, more proof to what I've been saying about my take regarding the Spurs, uh, the Cowboys. And their biggest issue, not even being uh, the coaches, the players, but their biggest problem being Jerry Jones. So uh, my boy, and I like to say my boy because he's my favorite football coach of all time, NFL and college, uh, Jimmy Johnson, my boy, Jimmy Johnson, um, has been doing spots every week on the herd, Colin Cowherd. I watch Colin Colin Cowherd uh, religiously. Uh, he is one of my uh, one of my it's one of my favorite shows, The Herd. And so he does spots occasionally or every week. He's been doing a spot every week with them through this football season. And he uh, Jimmy Johnson came on earlier this week, and and he did uh, he did an interview and and they got to talking about Jimmy and Jerry and the Cowboys. And he said something to me and, you know, he hit it out of the park and, and he brought more justification to, you know, one of the takes that I've had for years now. And so Jimmy Johnson went under her and they get to talking about uh, Jimmy. And so Jamie, Jimmy said that, that uh, Jimmy uh, Jerry Jones's stubbornness is the reason that Mike McCarthy got another chance. I've been I've been saying that he should have been fired. Uh, this year is the gist of what we're going to get from him, and so obviously the Cowboys underachieve. Again, they had Super Bowl potential based on the on the, the the players they have and the squad that they had overall, and again was just one and done in the playoffs. And so, Jimmy Johnson goes on the herd and he says that Jerry Jones uh, will he's too stubborn to admit that he was wrong on Mark McCarthy. And I'm quoting, the following is going to be a quote, open quote. This is from Jimmy Johnson on The Herd talking about Jimmy, J Jimmy Jones sticking with Mike McCarthy. And I quote, Jerry doesn't ever want to admit he's wrong. 
He's going to hang with whoever and try to make it work. Close quote. This could not be further from the truth. And this is exactly what the problem has been for over 20 years now with our Dallas Cowboys, my Dallas Cowboys. He, he, Jerry never wants to admit that he's wrong. He makes his mind up about a player. He makes his mind up about a coach. And he sticks to that till the very end. And even at the very end when he's wrong, he will never admit it. He'll just make the move that he obviously needs to make. For example, Jason stupid-ass Garrett, who at this point ain't even in the NFL anymore. Maybe somebody's going to pick him up. I doubt it. In all these coaching moves, in all these coaching hires, in all these defensive co or offensive coordinators that have been hired and I've been keeping track, no one has hired Jason Garrett. And as much as there was a rumor about him ending up at Duke as a head coach, that hasn't even happened. So, so getting back to Jimmy coming on the herd, he's preaching. And he's preaching what I've been saying. And, and the problem with the Cowboys isn't the players. It ain't the assistants. It's Jimmy. I mean, excuse me, Jerry. And the fact that he decides on a player, on a coach, and will not get off of it. And even when he has to, he compounds the problem by moving on from a coach, for example, by moving on from a coach who didn't even deserve to be the head coach, Rudy, Jason Garrett, and moving on to another coach, Mike McCarthy, when there were better options out there. And I I wasn't a fan of the move for McCarthy from the get-go. Did I say it was going to fail miserably as it has? No, I did not. I gave him a little bit of the benefit of the doubt just because of the fact that he did actually want, win a Super Bowl with Aaron Rodgers. But still, I had my doubts. And there were better options out there. Um, but Jerry, like, I, I, I just, I, I don't, I don't get it. Like it, it blows my mind how for 20 years, over 20 years, he's been blowing it as a general manager, but he won't fire himself. He won't step aside and admit that he's wrong and hire an actual general manager, a legit general manager, somebody who actually knows freaking football. And I'm sorry, just because he played in Arkansas, that doesn't mean that he knows what the hell he's doing when it comes to making the right hires, signing the right players. I mean, this jackass one of the many stupid things that he's done off season, this offseason with his interviews that he's done, he goes and calls out Amari Cooper for not drawing more attention to his side of the ball when, oh, and then, he, you know, he compounds that idiocy by saying, well, when I pay you as a top player, I expect you to play and perform as a top player. Well, dumbass, he wasn't a top player for the teams that he was with prior to us. He wasn't, I mean, he, he's one of the better receivers in the league, but he's nowhere near, I mean, where, where, where are you going to put Amari Cooper, for example? He might crack my top 10, maybe. Even when he was with the Raiders, 
maybe he's going to crack my top 10, but if he's going to crack my top 10, he's going to crack the bottom 10. He's definitely not going to be in the top five, but your dumbass brings him on and signs him as a free agent, but you pay him as a top five receiver when he was never a top five receiver. And then you go into this off season and you call him out for not drawing more attention to his side of the ball. Hey, jackass. He was never that kind of a player. He was never kind of he was never the kind of player that was going to draw a double team. Amari Cooper is just not that good. So don't go calling him out when he doesn't do what you expected him to do just because you're paying him as if he's a top as if he's the best receiver in the league. He didn't do it in Oakland. He's not about to figure it out and start doing it here. It's not going to happen. That's just not the way it works. The same thing with Dak Prescott. When, 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 at the end of next year, when he's average again, you're gonna, are you gonna call? You're probably gonna call him out. For not, you know, winning an winning an actual playoff game again, or you know, and 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 going one and done if you even make the playoffs, but but then you're gonna, you're probably gonna turn around and call him out for not being more consistent or not doing this or not doing that the way you called out Amari Cooper. You're gonna look like the idiot because you're the one that's paying him as if he's the best quarterback in the league when he's not. So, at the end of the day, it's on you, Jerry. It's been on you for over 20 years now and it's going to continue to be on you until you either die or develop Alzheimer's where you can't function anymore and they got to put you in a home and you're going to be forced to step out of that general manager role, president role, owner role, whatever role it is that you do, you know, whatever other titles you give yourself. It, it, it's insane and it's mind-blowing that he can't figure this out himself. And also that his son and the daughter and whoever else is in that front office with him can't convince him, like, look, dad, look, boss, as a general manager, you suck. You really should give that up already and bring a general manager in. Give him five years. If he doesn't do better than five, than you in five years, then fire him and put yourself back in there then. But it's you got over 20 years of not even making it to the Super Bowl as proof that as a general manager, you suck plain and simple. You did the same thing with Zeke Elliott. You fell in love with him. You drafted him high. And you're paying him out the wazoo. And he's busted at this point. He's busted. He's never going to do what he did his rookie year. He has too many miles on those legs. Between all those runs in Ohio State and all the runs that he's had at the beginning of his career at this point, He's got way too many miles, but you're paying him as if he's just coming out fresh into the league. And it's like, dude, like, you know, it's one of my credence, my one of my creeds when it comes to football is I would never, ever, ever pay a running back even a top seven salary of a running back. I wouldn't. Running backs are like prostitutes. You go down to the next corner, you're going to find another one. We're in a passing league. You don't need a Derrick Henry or a Christian McCaffrey that's going to break the bank. I mean, granted, they produce, but at the end of the day, what Super Bowl have they played in? What AFC Championship, NFC Championship game have they gotten to? They haven't. So you don't need to break the bank on a running back to get there. I mean, how many how many thousand-yard running backs have the Patriots have in all the Super Bowls that they made? 
maybe one, maybe. But here you are, paying Amari Cooper top five receiver money, paying Dak Prescott top five quarterback money, paying Zeke Elliott top five quarter uh, running back money, and they're nowhere near worth it. I'm not saying Dak Prescott sucks, but you can't pay him more than Stafford. You can't pay him more than Aaron Rodgers. You can't even pay him more than Burrow. You can't pay him more than any of these other guys that are actually getting S done. You can't do that. I don't care what his agent tells you. And if you can't work it out, then trade his ass. You could have gotten rid of him for Matthew Stafford. I guarantee you the Detroit Lions would have traded Matthew Stafford to the Cowboys for Dak Prescott and a jar of pickles. I guarantee it. You cannot convince me that they wouldn't have done it. That's the trade you should have made. Because at the end of the day, Matthew Stafford is cheaper. And in my opinion, he's better than Dak Prescott. Oh, and he's in the Super Bowl. Finally. He finally got a good team. You can argue if they're better than good, but at least they're good. You can at least say they're good, right? And he finally got there. And Matthew Stafford is a hell of a quarterback. And I, I'm I'm on the Matthew Stafford bandwagon on Sunday. I've been on it since they made it, and and I'm going to be pulling for the Rams. I don't I hate California sports teams. I don't want California to get any championship, any. I I, I any if they're little if a little league team out of California makes it to the Little League World Series, I I'm praying to get their ass kicked. I'll take I take it out even on little punk kids from California. I want to see them get smoked in that little league world series. I don't want California to win any championship. Period. I don't care what sport it is. But I want the Rams to win on Sunday. <laughs> and it has nothing to do with Cali. It has nothing to do with the Rams. It has to do plain and simply with Matthew Stafford, a guy that I have been screaming. For years that he's overrated. And he just needed to get the hell out of Detroit to prove all the haters and the naysayers wrong. Now, to get back to the Cowboy take and the Jimmy Johnson take, it's he hit the nail on the head when he said that Jerry just will not admit ever, 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 ever that he's wrong. And it sucks because as y'all can see, I wear it some way, shape, or form. I wear the Cowboys. That's my team. That's my squad. You know, it's been like that. I don't know. I don't know anything else when it comes to NFL football. Uh, you know, for me, it's, it's 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 all about the Dallas Cowboys, and so it hurts me. It hurts me. As long as Jerry is sitting in that damn chair, it hurts because I know what I'm gonna get. I already know what I'm gonna freaking get. And you've got all these teams in the last 25 years that have gone in and out, Super Bowl, gotten the Super Bowls and gotten out. And in that time, in the last 25 years, I've seen the Cowboys have a good enough squad, a good enough squad to have at least one three to five Super Bowls in that span, including the squad this year. If you would have just gotten the right freaking coach, I think the right coach can win with Dak Prescott. I really do believe that you can win. Hell, Trent Dilfer won a Super Bowl. If Trent Dilfer can win a Super Bowl, Dak Prescott can win a Super Bowl. I'm not saying that the man is trash. I'm not. He's a good quarterback. 
what I'm saying is he ain't worth the amount of money that he's getting. And the more you pay a quarterback top five money, the more you pay a running back top five money, the more you pay receiver top five money, the less you have to spend on other pieces that can get that team, that can get a team over the top, that can get them to that finish line that is at least the NFC Championship. At least the NFC Championship. You know, he blew it when he decided that he wanted to make Jason Garrett a head coach when he had him as a, <laughs> as a, I believe he started as a quarterback's coach. And then he ended up making him a head coach from there. It's like, wow. Uh, no prior head coaching experience. Uh, you know, wasted all that time. He wasted time with that son of a bum. Uh, he wasted time with, with Dave Campo. He wasted time with, oh, just the names, the, the list just goes on and on. And, you know, the one time that he had gotten it right was with Bill Parcells. And even then, he pissed off Bill Parcells enough that the guy just threw his hands up and said, I can't do this with you. You know, when Bill Parcells throws his hands up because you're the owner of the problem, then at the end of the day, that is where the issue lies for the Dallas Cowboys. So, Jimmy, preach, Jimmy. As long as Jerry doesn't admit that he's wrong and he stays stubborn, what has transpired for the Cowboys the last 25 plus the last 20 plus years will continue so all right the last uh the last topic I'm gonna hit on today is the Super Bowl preview so we finally got it we finally got it this weekend El Super Bowl preview the Super Bowl goes down on Sunday and uh look uh, I've 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 already mentioned it earlier, or you know, in this podcast that I'm a huge Matthew Stafford fan. I'm pulling for the Rams this weekend because I want Matthew Stafford to win it and 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 shove it up, you know, all the haters' rear ends. Uh, but and I'm again, I'm gonna I'm gonna be biased, right? I, I'm a fan of Matthew Stafford and I really want him to win, but I'm look I've looked at it. Uh, the line is four and a half points right now. The Rams are favored by four and a half. Give up the four and a half points. I'm telling you right now. Lock it in for the Super Bowl. Give up the four and a half points. It's going to come down to one thing and one thing only. The defensive line of the Rams going up against the offensive line of the Bengals. Before they played the Chiefs, the Bengals played the Tennessee Titans. And the Tennessee Titans line is nowhere near on the level of the Rams. And they sat. They didn't just touch him. They didn't just pressure him. They didn't just hurry him. They sat Burrow nine times. What do you think is going to happen when a way better line that the St. Louis Rams do have, a way better line, Goes up against that same offensive line of the Cincinnati Bengals. If the Tennessee Titans got to him nine times, the Rams are going to get to him minimum, minimum five times. At the least, they're going to get five sacks, probably more. The majority of these games, when you get into the playoffs, are won in the trenches. This game is going to come down to the trenches. I got the I got the Rams winning by at least ten points, if not more. I just don't think that the 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 Cincinnati Bengals are going to be able to handle not just the offense, the defensive line of the Rams and Donald and the boy and Von Miller, but McVeigh is a genius at figuring out different blitzes and different things that he can do to get pressure on Burrow. 
And if you weren't able to handle Tennessee, you're not going to be able to handle the Rams' defensive line. And for me, that's what this game comes down to. You got Cooper Cup as a receiver uh, on the Rams' side. Well, you got Chase as a receiver on the Bengals. That evens out. You got Matthew Stafford and Burrow as quarterbacks. Some are going to argue that Burrow is even better than Stafford. Okay, I guess I could give you that. I'm going to stick with Stafford, me personally. But you could probably convince me that Burrow is better. He's definitely younger. He's playing his ass off. And he's a tough son of a bee. You don't get sacked nine times and keep getting up. Unless you're tough. So, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the quarterbacks even themselves out. The receivers even themselves out. Oh, and actually, no. I'm going to give the Rams a slight edge. Odell Beckham Jr. And Odell's been on a heater lately. Especially in the playoffs. So, He's already proven that he wasn't the problem in Cleveland. And I think I think Odell Beckham comes up huge for the Rams in this game as well. So I'm telling you now, book it. Take the Rams, give up the four and a half, because the Rams are going to win this game. And I and I really, really do believe they're going to win by more than 10 points. I really, really do. I like the Bengals story. I like Joe Burrow. I like Jamar Chase. I like a lot of the players that they have. But it's coming down to the defensive line of the Rams and the offensive line of the Bengals. And I just don't think Cincinnati is ready for the smoke that Darnold, Miller, and Ramsey are going to bring overall on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, you know, Cincinnati's got some ballers. But you got to keep in mind, uh, they came in with the worst offensive line in the AFC when it comes to the playoffs. So they've gotten here mostly by grit and determination. But when you get to the end and it's one team left that you got to beat, you've gotten to the point where it's the best of the best. And the Rams with McVay, who were I'm also giving the Rams a coaching edge. McVay, uh, oh, my goodness. I, I'm drawing a blank on, on Cincinnati's coach. But uh, is it Zach Taylor? Yeah, Zach Taylor. You got to give the edge on coaching over to McVay, over Taylor. You know, Taylor's good. He's young. He's got his voice scrapping and fighting and clawing. But I just don't see them being able to handle what the Rams are going to do on the defensive end. I just, I just don't see it. I don't see it at all. I just, I cannot picture a scenario where the Cincinnati Bengals are going to be, are good enough to get over on the Rams. I, I just don't see it. So my pick for the Super Bowl is the Rams. I think they're going to win by more than 10 points. I'm telling you now, give up the Rams minus, take the Rams and give up the points. Right now it's at four and a half. I mean, I didn't look at it today, but when I woke up, when I went to bed last night, it was four and a half. It may have changed. I haven't looked, but I'm going to guess it's still sitting at four and a half. Um, I put my money off right off the bat on the Rams as soon as the line came down. Um, and I got it at five. So it's down to four and a half. And right now, let's see. Right now, the line is still sitting at, or I should not still, but the line is sitting at. Oh, it's gone down to three and a half. Wow. It's actually gone down to three and a half. And you got an over under of 48 and a half. So right now, Caesars, it's been, it's getting pounded. It's getting pounded. The money's getting, the Rams, are, the, the people are pounding the Rams on that. So it's, it's going down. It's going down. It's going down. So, so yeah, um, we're going to take in the Rams. We're giving up. I got five when I did it. It was at four and a half, at four and a half, and now it's down to three and a half. So, again, I'm still saying give up the points, take the Rams. They're gonna win by at least ten points. So, uh, so yeah, uh, that's Super Bowl preview. And uh, Rams, right now it's at three and a half. Give them up, give them up. Don't 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 worry. They're gonna take it. They're gonna take it by ten plus points. Um, I'm really looking forward to the halftime show as well. Um, I'm going to end up betting some props also, so you can follow me on my uh, social media uh, on Facebook, Manuel H. Rodriguez Jr. 
And on my Twitter, at Marod, M-A-H-R-O-D, I'm going to be posting my prop bets there. I love prop betting the Super Bowl. Um, I'm going to bet the coin toss. I'm going to bet the length of the national anthem. I'm going to bet the color of the Gatorade. Uh, I'm going to bet, uh, dang, uh, there's like, there's a minimum of five that I do right off the bat, religiously. So uh, look for my props on our uh, Twitter, at Marod. On Facebook, uh, Manuel H. Rodriguez Jr., and I'll be putting my prop bets up there. Um, so, yeah. So, I want to thank you all for joining me. Again, don't forget to visit manscaped.com. The promo code is Pub Sports. You get $24 off an all in one package. Um, and that's going to be it for this week. I want to thank y'all very much for joining in. Uh, go ahead and message me any kind of comments, any kind of takes. Uh, message me on my tw- on my Twitter if you want to as well. Um, we will holler at y'all last week. We'll talk about the Super Bowl, obviously Super Bowl results. We'll see. Uh, we'll see what else pops off in the NBA. Uh, we'll take a look and see how the Spurs are doing since these trades have uh, have gone off. We'll see what other moves they make since they have some open roster spots now. Uh, but nonetheless, thank you very much. We are signing off from Southtown 101. Thank you very much. And we are out. Mm-hmm.